So good to be here today. God is so good, isn't he? Uh, beautiful, beautiful weather outside. And uh, what more can we ask for? And, and even if it was snowing outside, we have to say, this is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Because God still created it. For our pleasure and for our praise to him. God in the storms of life while Jesus sleeps in the boat. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever pondered that thought that Jesus Christ was sleeping in the boat during a storm? Before we do that, before we go into God's word this morning from Mark chapter 4, let's just bow for a word of prayer. Our Father God, we've had an awesome worship time. sang many powerful songs towards your holiness and your awesomeness. But Lord, we thank you for your word. The word that was spoken this morning, the word that will be spoken, is how you want to communicate to us today. Lord, we come with our journey whatever it was this last week, whatever it is today, whatever it will be. And it's in those moments that we walk through this life that you desire to continually teach us and to mold us and to shape us after your likeness. So I pray, Father God, that your Holy Spirit would teach us today through your word. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Mark chapter 4. We've all talked about faith. We've all discussed what it means. And, and, and I want to define faith as, as acting like God is telling the truth. Faith is measured by feet and, and not by feelings. It, faith is measured by walk and, and not by talk. Faith is measured by life, not by lips. You see, Jesus Christ had been teaching all day long. He had been talking to the multitudes. He had been talking to the crowds. And, and he had been preaching a big sermon. But now he takes his disciples aside. And he gives them a private word. It's like Jesus Christ taking us aside and, and giving us a, a private word to, to, to ponder and to reflect. And we read in verse 33 of Mark chapter 4. And with many such parables he was speaking the word to them so far as they could able to hear it and he did not speak to them without a parable but he was explaining everything in private to his own disciples and so there in verse 35 he tells his disciples this I want you to get into the boat and let us go to the other side leaving the crowd they they took him along with them in the boat just as he was and the other boats were with him So let's get something straight right from the beginning as we start our journey this morning with Jesus Christ. The disciples are smack dab in the very will of God because he's asked them to join him in a boat to the other side. They're absolutely the most perfect place to be. Right? Think about it for a moment. Jesus said, get in the boat and so they got in the boat after the sermon. And they were in the will of God. Sitting in that boat. Starting to roar across to the other side. But there's a problem. The problem is, is described in verse 37 of that chapter. There arose a fierce gale of wind. And the waves were breaking over the boat so that the boat was already filling up. The Greek word here for, for this the storm, where this fierce gale of wind is laylop. A laylop is a tumultuous storm coming out of nowhere in the Sea of Galilee. So this ought to clarify that, that they're in this boat because Jesus has asked them to be there. It tells you that they're still in the center of God's will because he's commanded them to go with him. And something that we sometimes just can't get our minds wrapped around. We can still be in this lay lab. And still be in the center of God's will. It's a tumultuous situation. 
The other thing you need to know about this lay lap is, is it's merciless. It comes down on you and it seeks to consume you. Seeks to destroy you. The boat is filling up. The wind is blowing and it, it, with such speed that it threatens to take them under. And anybody that's been in that kind of situation, they're going to say, man, we're going to sink. We're going to drown. And it's going to overwhelm you with fear. A storm and, and this kind of trial, this unexpected circumstance that they didn't see coming, that circumstance that invades your life, that threatens your very existence. And we're talking about that situation where your life is on the line and, and where, where you don't know what to do or, or where you're going or how you're going to get through it. And, and the storm seeks to destroy you. The storm is always designed to increase your faith and give you this deeper experience with God. Storms, as we know it, are unpleasant. They're uncomfortable. They, they're life-threatening at times. But they always come with a purpose. So here they are in this crisis. And the question I have for you this morning is, have you ever been in a crisis? Maybe you're in a crisis right now. They're in a crisis. And the crisis is threefold. There are actually three storms that are occurring here within this time and this moment of their lives. And the first storm is a circumstantial storm. It's the lay lap. Here's something about a circumstantial storm. And that is a storm over which you exercise no control. You can't control the wind. You can't control the sea. You can't control the rain. You can't control the spinning of the turmoil. You can't control the waves and the billowing up and, and the tossing over. And, and, and you can't control that your boat's filling up. It's out of control. You have no control over it. So you can be in the absolutely perfect will of God and in the storm and, and be absolutely doing nothing about it because you can't control it. It's circumstances that produce the helpless feelings that we sometimes have. The hopeless scenario that we experience when we're going through that storm, that lay lap. That's storm number one. That leads us to storm number two. And storm number two is because they're terrified. And, and the storm is called emotional instability. We know that they're terrified because Jesus is going to say to them, Why are you afraid? In verse 40. They weren't scared when they got into that boat. But now they're terrified. They think they're going to die. We not only have storms of circumstances in our lives, but we also have storms of emotion. And because our emotions sometimes get riveted up, we get scared and we get terrified of that doctor's report or, or that financial struggle or that relationship direction. And we get scared and we, and we start to worry and we start to fret and we start to think life is totally out of control. And whatever it is that you can't control that's causing your emotions to be uprooted is your lay lap. Because something so big and and something so deep and, and something so devastating, you can't control it. You try, but you can't. And so the first storm are the circumstances that are completely out of control for these disciples and in your own life. And the second storm is this emotional instability because it's uncontrollable. But there's a third storm. And the third storm is called this theological storm. It's because not only was the circumstance out of control, their emotions are responding because of these circumstances, and now they're in the spiritual storm, this theological storm, because the scripture goes on to say that they woke Jesus up. In verse 38, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? See, that's a spiritual storm. 
because their circumstances were completely out of their control and, and their emotions are going crazy. Have you been there? You lay awake all night long wondering how you're going to get through this storm that you have found yourself in, this lay lap that you are experiencing. And, and your emotions go nuts. So what I've heard about Jesus and what I'm experiencing right now just don't match up. He's sleeping. If we were to tell the truth, there have been many times when we have raised the question like Mary and Martha, where were you when I needed you? Maybe you even asked yourself that this last week, maybe this morning. Because... You would have been here, Jesus. It wouldn't be this painful if you had been here, Jesus. It wouldn't have taken this long if you had been here, Jesus. It wouldn't hurt this bad if you had been here, Jesus. Teacher, do you really care? Or is all this just theological nonsense I was raised up to believe that you are always there? Let's go a little deeper because verse 38 says Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. Ponder that thought for a moment. He brought his pillow on this journey. Let that sink in. Because it's vitally important to remember that. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. No, you didn't, Jesus. No, you really didn't do this. Jesus, I am in the storm and you're snoring. I'm in the storm and you're sleeping. I'm in the storm and you actually brought your pillow to, so that you could get a good rest. What good is a Savior? What good is Jesus Christ who sleeps through your storm. So not only is Jesus Christ asleep, not only is he asleep on purpose, he's asleep in a terrifying situation. Now I've got another problem because he's sleeping on me and he's in the same storm I'm in and he's in the same boat I'm on. I've got a real problem with this Jesus. He's asleep in the storm. And the only way he gets up is if I'm going to go over to him and shake him awake. How on earth could he sleep through that? I find our teenagers can sleep through anything, right? How did Jesus sleep through this? It said they woke Jesus up. Jesus... Why is the storm not messing with you like it is with us? Because it's messing with everyone else in this boat and you're still sleeping. Come on, Jesus. It's time to get up. Does Jesus care about my pain? Have you asked yourself that question? My finances, my, my loneliness, my hurt, my depression, my discouragement, whatever it may be, because I'm in his will and I feel all this. And so they wake Jesus up. And in verse 39, Jesus gets up and he, he rebukes the wind. He says to the sea, hush your fuss, hush and be still. Be calm, be, peace be still. And notice who Jesus is talking to. He's going to talk to his disciples. That's coming. But he's not talking to them right now. He's talking to the circumstance, that, that, other, that first storm. The circumstances, the wind and, and the sea and the storm and the waves. He doesn't speak to his disciples yet. He speaks to the situation. And when he, but when does he speak to the situation? After they wake him up. Jesus is sleeping. And they wake him up. And when they wake him up, he speaks to that circumstance that's causing this whole crisis in the first place. So don't let it be said that in your crisis continues because you never took time to wake up the Savior. 
In other words, you were not so concerned about it. And getting his attention wasn't as important as you might let other people believe because you wake up your friends and you wake up people with power and you wake up people who you think can change it. And a lot of times we don't try to wake up the Savior. And we go to Jesus as that last resort. We've all been there. We've all done it. And so Jesus turns to the disciples. He says, why are you afraid? Verse 40, how is it that you have no faith? I don't know about you, but I have a lot of issues with that question. Because that question doesn't make sense to me. They wake Jesus up, and the boat's filling with water. They're in the lay lap, and it's a terrible storm. They don't even know whether they're going to live or die. And Jesus is going to ask a question like that. Why are you afraid? Why do you have no faith? I don't know, Jesus, but it seems pretty evident that we're going to die. You go back to verse 35, because in verse 35, Jesus said, let us go to the other side. Not, let me go to the other side. Let us go to the other side. So he, he's there with him, with them all, and he, he, he's wanting to hang out with them. And they laugh shouting because they're excited because they get to go in a boat ride with Jesus. But then those circumstances showed up. And that situation overrode everything. We get all excited because Jesus is our Savior and he saved us from our sins and, and then life happens. Where are you? The God that can take our sins and forgive us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We become one of his, his sons and his daughters. And if he can do something that powerful, die on the cross and shed his blood and, and raise from the dead, and then suddenly we have a storm and God, I don't think he can do this. In other words, often in our times is, is, is the problem that we are facing right now or have faced or are going to face overrides God's promise. And we're now living in light of the, the problem, in, in light of the, the, the terror, and, and, and no longer living in the light of the promise of Jesus. And when you live in the light of the problem and, and no longer in the light of the promise, the problem will always dominate you. And it will totally erase the fact that Jesus ever said anything to you. Let's go in the boat together to the other side. You see, God knows all about your circumstances. He doesn't want you to deny them. A storm is a storm, right? You don't call it a sunshiny day if it's storming outside. A storm is a reality, but he never wants your circumstances to trump his word. Let me say that again. He never wants your circumstances that you're facing right now to trump his word. He doesn't want your circumstances to trump his presence because he's on the boat too. You're doing exactly what he told them to do. But because of the next level I'm talking to you, I will appear to be asleep and you won't hear anything from heaven and you'll say, God, like, where are you? I mean, he spoke to the wind, he, he told the wind, just peace, peace, peace be still. He told the sea to shh. And Jesus spoke to the circumstances that day. What happens? The circumstances change. And so the issue in the laylop is not your ability to change the circumstances. The issue in the laylop is your communication with Jesus so that he can speak to it. Because obviously, if it's a laylop, it's completely out of your control. 
And so the issue is Jesus speaking into that storm, speaking into that terror that you're experiencing. And the problem was not them waking Jesus up. That wasn't the problem of the faithlessness. That was a good thing because he responded when they woke him up. The problem was the faithlessness that woke him up because they panicked. And they're living in terror with Jesus in the boat. You see, Jesus speaks to the problem, and, and when he speaks to the problem, there's a circumstantial change. And it leads us to the conclusion of what was taking place there that day in verse 41. And they became very much afraid. When they were in the lay lap, they were afraid. And when they saw who they were dealing with, they became very, very, very much afraid. In other words, we're afraid of the wrong thing sometimes. See, we let our circumstances and those struggles and those storms in life cause us terror. Cause us to be afraid. He says, when you know who you're dealing with, you'd be less afraid of that and more scared of me. Because if I tell the storm to calm down, what can I do with you? If you're going to be scared, then what we need to do is that your fear ought to be towards the great I am and not what the circumstance is in your life. Because once I get up, all I have to do is talk to it. I wonder, has anybody ever heard God talk into a situation that you've gone through? Something that's totally out of control and, and nobody knew how they could help you and you didn't have the things that you thought you should have and in the moments of those circumstances that you were facing and God spoke into that. Has that ever happened? Heaven spoke into it, and suddenly everything changes. And out of nowhere, something dramatic and a miracle takes place. It's more important to walk by faith and get Jesus dealing with the circumstance than living out of fear, in other words. Don't be scared of the wrong thing. And they ask a question because they're scared now. Who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. Who then is this? Obviously, we don't know who he is. Let me tell you something. When Jesus is in humanity asleep, his deity is still awake because he's God. Who then is this? They were on a journey of discovery and, and trials as inconvenient and, and as painful as they are are a journey of discovery of who we're actually dealing with in, in the person of Jesus Christ. God has placed you in the storm and it's not convenient right now. It could happen next week better. Like, I, I'm actually, no more storms, right? I'm not trying to make light of it, but, but you're in a situation where, where God wants you to know who you're dealing with. And you're dealing with an almighty, powerful God. See, they have seen some things about Jesus. But Jesus is saying to them that day, they don't know who I am yet. They don't understand who they're dealing with yet. So let's them, let me show them a little something, something about who I am. So he changes that circumstance. The sea is calm. And he tells them, your faith is not where I want it to be yet. And they say, who are you? Because many of us in our own lives have still got them in the manger somewhere. So many times within our personal lives, we don't know who we're dealing with yet. With God, that is. 
I mean, he's tired, so he goes to sleep because he's human. He gets up, he puts the lay lap to sleep because he's God, because he's God, because he's human. And we call this in theology a hypostatic union. It means two natures in one person, unmixed forever, unmixed forever. Two natures and, and one person, unmixed forever. So he's both human and divine. One moment he's raising people from, from the dead, and the next moment he's asleep because he's really too tired. Come on, who, who are you? What manner of man is this that I'm looking at, standing at the end of that boat? Hebrews 4 tells us that we have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our pain. How can you sympathize with my pain? Because I'm human, Jesus said. So I feel what you feel, the way that you felt it, but I'm also divine. See, see, when when I, I go to you or you go to me, that's human to human. We're connecting on that level. I may be able to sympathize in some way, but I can't fix it. But when you deal with the God man, you're dealing with someone who can feel it and someone that can fix it. And God says, because I'm man, I know how you feel. I know what you're going through. But because I'm God, I can do something about it. What manner of man is this that even the circumstances, the nature obeys him? Nature has to succumb to him. If you have a lay lap, if you don't have one, keep living, you will. God wants to take you to a place of understanding him more, so that's why they come into your life. He wants to take you to a place you've never been before. That's where they come in your life. And the disciples and Jesus were on this open lake, and what was worse, God knew they were going to be there, just like he knows when we get caught up in the storms of life. He never told his disciples when they got into that boat that day that they would experience a storm. But he was there. Jesus told them, let's go to that other side, and that was on dry dock. He said, before we ever leave, I'm going to tell you where that wind's going to come up. No, he didn't say that. He said, we're just going to the other side together. He didn't say that there's going to be some rough sailing and, and, and after we leave this shoreline, but your salvation and your Savior is here with you. No, he didn't say that. He hasn't forgotten you in your own storms, in your own struggles, in your own pain, in, in, your, in your life experiences that you have right now. He knows how to get you from point A to C. Even if you have to go back to B and then go to T and then back to F and then to X, in order to get there, he's still in control of it all. He knows how to take you from here to there because it was built with you in mind, including your struggle, including that lay lap. And the disciples learned something very significant that day that would transform their lives. And we can learn from their experience. You see, God ordains the storms of life. It's something that people have wrestled with in a long time. That the idea that God permits those things to happen in our life it is an extremely hard pill to swallow. It doesn't make sense that a loving God would allow his, his, his followers to suffer. But, but there's a very simple thing in how to solve this. For Jesus tells us in John chapter 16, verse 33, in this world you have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And so Jesus promises his followers this, you will have a trial. You'll have tribulations. you have persecutions. People will try to kill you. People will try to destroy you with their words. He's saying you're going to have this stuff. But he's overcome the world. And so we can trust him in the storms. 
And so when that storm hits, we often wonder, why is this happening? Ever been there? Like, why is it happening to me? It's inconvenient right now. In James 1, it says that we see God has a purpose for every trial that we experience. And God uses those trials to, to test the genuineness of, of how strong our faith is. And the disciples' faith in Jesus was being tested through this storm on that lake that day. And they questioned the very character of Jesus Christ, implying that he didn't care for them. And we may feel the same way when we face that health crisis or that other hardship. And we say, God, like, where are you? Don't you care for us? First Peter chapter 5, verse 7 says, as it reminds us that we should cast all our cares and concerns on Jesus. Why? Because he cares for us. You see, God ordains the storms of life, but God is in control of those very storms that he allows to take shape within our experience as we walk through this world. And the disciples were filled with great fear, and, and Jesus rebuked the wind and said, peace be still, and it, it's calm. And so he displayed this supernatural power over nature, and, and we learn along with the, the disciples that day that Jesus can be trusted in the storm. Why? Because he's sovereign. It's God. And Jesus' or God's sovereignty, Jesus' sovereignty is described in Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's. And everything in it. The world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. God is in perfect control of the universe. He is involved in everything in the world and is directing all things, people, nature, to fulfill his divine purposes. And sometimes we wonder, what on earth is going on? Well, maybe some of those storms that we see around us is to wake up to church and start praying that God would have dominion from sea to shining sea. So when you're facing the storms of life and understanding the sovereignty of an amazing God, it's extremely essential to how you walk through this journey. The disciples showed us both what to do and what not to do. They were right to go to Jesus in the storm. That was absolutely perfect. However, they fell short because they went to him in fear. They went to him in doubt. Because they were paralyzed at what was happening right at that moment. And Jesus wanted them to, to have faith in him in the midst of that storm. Even if he was sleeping there in that boat. In Philippians chapter 4, it tells us that we should learn to replace our, our fear. And, 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 and learn to replace our anxieties with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. We are to release ourselves from the grip of fear and anxiety when we come before the presence of a holy and almighty God and thank him for his sovereign power and for the purpose of the storms that we may be experiencing. We can trust him in this promise that his peace will guard our hearts, that his peace will protect our minds so that we will not be fearful or anxious during that storm that we face in our lives. But friends, that's easier said than done, isn't it? Because we're so human. God taking us through one storm, and the next time that storm comes along, we're right back to where those disciples were. Jesus! Why are you sleeping? God is for you in the storms of life. In their fear, the disciples questioned whether or not Jesus even cared for them. And and he asked them, why are you so afraid? Do you still not have any faith? And not only did Jesus rebuke that wind and the waves, but he also gave a rebuke to his, his disciples. And you no doubt you have experienced within your own personal life those gentle rebukes from, from God as, as he takes you through a storm. Isaiah 41 verse 10 says, Fear not, for I'm with you. Be not dismayed, for I'm your God. Believing that God is for you can transform your life. I remember a pastor that once came 
and chatted with me. And, and we were in ministry together in northern Saskatchewan. He was this older gentleman and, and uh, just loved the Lord. It was a great prayer warrior. And we'd get together once a week and, and just to intercede before God's throne. I remember him telling me, he says, make sure you're anchored deep in God in the good times. Make sure you're anchored deep in God in the good times, spending time in his word and learning as much as you can of how God works and how God has moved in the lives of others. They're recorded in scripture so that when that storm comes, you often don't have enough sense in your head to, to, to try to figure things out. That you need to have that anchor deep with God so that God can draw your fear and bring you back to reality of who he is. But if you wait for the storm to anchor yourself, you're going to drift. And I pondered that thought for some time until I went fishing with one of my really great buddies of mine in, in Turtleford, Saskatchewan. And he would take me out, and, and I only went along because his wife didn't want him to go out by himself, and he was in his late 80s, and, and, uh, and he would always lose all track of time because when you get in a fishing boat, you fish till you can't see another thing. And so we're out there, and, and, and so we threw this anchor into Turtle Lake to fish for some walleye. It was a really, really windy day, and, and suddenly we began to drift. Anchor hadn't held, because it was sandy. And so he turns to me, and all his wisdom, he says, well, he says, I guess we better learn to anchor in the rock of Jesus Christ. We need to anchor in God. So when the trials come and we're tempted to doubt in God's love and care and concern for us, when, when it seems that there's no sound coming from heaven and we don't hear him and we've been praying a long time, you can still believe that God's there. The storms of life are a part of God's sanctification for your life. They're there to reveal your heart. And to grow you into his image. Those difficult moments that we face in our journey as we run this race of life. Are not bigger than the promises of Jesus Christ. He promises to be with you through all those storms. He allows in your life to take place. So allow those storms as you face them and as you see them coming or are experiencing them right now to propel you to trust God and, as your refuge and your deliverer. So in closing, I, I want to give you some questions to ponder in this coming week. The first question is this. When the storms of life hit, what's your first reaction? It's very good to, to sometimes take time to journal and to write down when those emotions that you're feeling so you can look back on it on a later date and, and help someone else through that same journey. Because God commands us to do that in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. So when storms of life hit you, what's your first reaction? How, how, how did you react to that last storm? Second question is this. Can you look back on a previous storm in your life and accept that God ordained that storm and was in control of it? That's a, that's, that's a hard one. Can you look back on the previous storms in your life and accept the fact that God ordained that storm and was in complete control of it? Can you accept that? Sometimes it takes us some time to go back on those storms and say, okay, God, certainly didn't like it. In fact, it was sometimes I really was really, really mad at you and shaking my fist at you. David did that. Read through the Psalms. But he always came back to 
the focal point, and that was to worship God. He'd begin the psalm, and he'd start off with, God, you don't care, God, he was complaining. He was grumbling, and he was like not accepting what was going on in his life, but he'd always come back to the sovereign God and say, God, I worship you. The third question is this. How will the realization that God was for you impact your fear? How will the realization that God is for you impact your fear in the next storm that hits? It's not if, it's when. When the next storm hits. Questions to ponder. Where does it take you this morning? How should you respond? Anchor deep to the word of God. Take time to spend time in his word. I get lots of opportunity, actually my job to do that. Sit and wash the dishwasher work. I sit there and I read the Word of God, ponder it, reflect on it. Partly because I know that if I cover every inch of the hotel in which Karen and I work at with God's Word, it's got to bring a harvest, right? So it's spend time in God's Word, anchored deep with Him, and pray often. Let's close in prayer. Our Father God, I thank you so much for who you are. Thank you, God, that you care for us, that you walk through us through every circumstance of our life that we will ever face as we walk through this journey, as we wait till you call us home. I pray, Father God, that in those moments as we struggle to work on our faith, to believe that you are a God that really cares for us and and. and, and and wants what's best for us, that even in those circumstances where we feel that you have forsaken us and walked away from us, that those promises within your word that will come back to our minds and will increase our faith and help us in our journey as we walk day by day with Jesus. We thank you so much for your people gathered here this morning. Pray, Father God, that you will just cover them with your presence and, and may they journey with your Holy Spirit and may they impact lives as they rub shoulders with people this week. That through their own testimony as they walk through life, that, that your kingdom would grow because of it. In Jesus' precious name we pray.